Hi everybody, thanks for joining us for another edition of Hold My Dream, where we navigate the news and politics with a chaser of civility. I'm your host, Jen, inviting you to grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and imagine with us how to create a new American identity together. Welcome to this week's Hold My Drink and Counterweight podcast with my co-host, David Bernstein. Today, we have Lyle Asher with us. He is a professor of English at Lewis and Clark University. And so we've got a lot of questions for you, Lyle, but before we get started, did you bring anything to the table? I know it's earlier for you than it is for us to drink for this conversation. I'm just drinking water today. I'm I'm sad to report. <laughs> <laughs> it is Thursday and, and, and hitting on happy hour where we're at. David, what about you? With a little scotch, not too much because I still have a meeting after this, but it's a uh, it's blend <laughs> fitted 17, maybe. Very I think good. you know, a sure. little a little drink helps everything. I've got to tell you, I'm doing something new that I'm very excited about, and I'm pretty sure that I rock at this recipe, but I don't know if you've all have heard of a Michelada. I'm not. No. Okay, familiar. well, it's a very kind of like, you know, it's a Mexican Michelada. So Southern it's being in Texas, I guess it's more popular here, but you guys might gross out a little bit. But it's mm-hmm. <laughs> it is um, it is tomato juice and beer. That is well. <laughs> wow, that is a little interesting. Yeah, it is surprisingly good. That's all. I'm, if you like bloody wow, mary, okay. Yep. So there you have it. So yeah. take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> with that said, um, David, you take it away with the first question for Lyle. Sure. Sure. So, Lyle, as you know, I've been uh, following your work for a while. You wrote this um, incredibly important essay for Quillette about the role education schools play in advancing an ideology that we now see at universities, we now see K-12 education. You wrote a follow-up piece for the Chronicle of Higher Education that built on that previous piece in Quillette. Um, tell us about, I mean, it would, these were very in-depth articles. Tell us a little bit about what your findings were in there. Well, the, uh, the, the, the Chronicle piece, actually, the, the big one, it came, it came first, and then it was reprinted in Quillette, right? I and then I have another, a couple of other pieces in Quillette. But the Chronicle piece, and I think this is the one you're referring to, is about education schools. And, uh, yes. And the title, I, the title that uh, my editor chose, and I was very happy with it. It's called "How Education Schools Became a Menace and uh, a Menace to Higher Education." And um, you know, this is something that has really flown under the radar for uh, two decades, and I didn't, I didn't even know it was happening myself. And I'm at a college. And it's a small enough college so that you know uh, not only your fellow faculty members in your department, you know faculty members uh, uh, across the college and you know administrators, right? So um, the fact that I didn't know it was happening suggests that if you're at a university, the chance if you're understanding the ways in which the university is moving are slim to none. So in fact, I was at a the size of the college was perfect to be able to see this up close. So what I found was, uh, and this it starts at different places at different times, but around 2010, uh, I just noticed things changed rather dramatically, the way people were talking. And the people that were talking in these strange ways were administrators. And I initially just, you know, sort of brushed it off. I thought, well, we've just made a bad hire or two. And then I kept noticing that no matter how many administrators were replaced, we sing, we got the same language. Mm. And then I began noticing, you know, these blowups around the country. And this is around 2012, 2013, 2014. Uh, and then I noticed this language was not just confined to my college in the Pacific Northwest, but it was everywhere. And so I just began sort of tracing. I wanted to find out who these people were. Mm -hmm. And by people, I just mean administrators that work in student facing positions, not say a provost or a vice president or a president, but typically a dean of students or 
associate dean of students, or later on you get offices in you know diversity, equity, and inclusion, or student engagement, or sustainability. You know this multiplication of offices, and I began noticing that all of those uh, administrators had almost without exception, one thing in common. And that was a background in education schools. Mm. And I knew a little bit about ed schools uh, and I knew enough to think very poorly of most of them. And uh, so it, it really began, it began there. And what struck me was, and this is the most remarkable thing of all, that, um, you know, the, the, the sort of beacon of American education, the bright spot in the American education landscape has always been colleges and universities for all their problems that they had in starting and well, you go back as far as you want. But uh, even in the early 2000s, for all of their problems, uh, they were still educating students in traditional subjects for the most part um, and doing a, a pretty good job at it. Not as good as they could have done, but they were they were doing it. Uh, the last thing you ever wanted to do was begin mirroring uh, the the real blight in on the American educational landscape, which is the K through twelve public education system. You know, you just felt that if you got through the K through twelve system and got to college, you were in a different world because now you were dealing with. Uh, professors who had studied for a long time in a particular subject and subject matter was supreme. That was the idea. Whereas that's really not the case in K through 12 with obvious exceptions. There are very good high school teachers. There are very good middle school and elementary teachers out there. But in general, the K through 12 system has been a kind of basket case. And it has been that way for a long time for particular reasons. One of those reasons is the way we train our teachers. And if you begin looking into this, you know, <laughs> you, you can go back a hundred years and you will find early complaints um, uh, going back as far as the 1920s, 30s, 40s. And it's unremitting um, uh, about what student uh, t or teacher education schools, how they're failing our teachers and therefore failing our students. The idea that then we would turn to these institutions to fill up administrative ranks in colleges and universities uh, is just unfathomable when you first see it. And of course, if you know anything about those ed schools and their problems, the results that we're seeing now are entirely predictable. Um, so I'll just finish up with a question by saying that um, one of the ways in which this happened has to do with the fact that there was a kind of professionalization of the administrative side of the universities in, in the 90s. You know, back in the 70s, if somebody was gonna be a dean of students, typically they pulled them in from the faculty ranks, right? Kicking and screaming most of the time. They'd do their time for three or four years and they'd, they'd be put back into the, into the faculty. But these are people who'd had at least a fair amount of experience with, you know, students in classrooms. They knew things were complicated. Uh, and they were used to dealing students without, without an agenda in mind, right? Well, in the 90s and then from, from that time forward, uh, higher education began pr professionalizing those ranks. And faculty were all too willing to let it be professionalized. I use professionalized here with scare quotes, by the way. Uh, that is uh, because it just meant that faculty were relieved of burdens they didn't want to want to shoulder anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, Derek Bach had a warning about this in his 2005 book um, called um, Our Underachieving Colleges and Universities. And he said, you know, and he was already noticing it, that when we turned over what he called the extracurriculum, that is the life in the campus outside the classroom, when we turned that over to the administrative class without faculty oversight, we were uh, looking for trouble. I only read that book in 2013, and I thought um, I should have I should have paid attention to that. I should have read that book when it came out because uh, we might have avoided a lot of problems. Of course, everybody would have had to have read it 
in order for this to be to have been sort of uh, challenged at the beginning. Anyway, I don't know if that if that helps. Uh, let, let me go. A, yeah, and then, by the way, listening to you makes me want to drink my scotch. Um, <laughs> but um, let me let me go a little deeper. What are the particular ideological manifestations? You said that you started to hear people talk differently. How yes. so? What were the where what ideologies were being promoted, and how did they? Why were they being promoted? Well. Uh, I'll begin with the first time I ever heard someone talk about uh, or say the phrase is not the intention, it's the impact that counts, right? And David, I think you you began your essay in Quillette with someone saying that, the woman who was apologizing uh, for having not mentioned uh, Islamophobia in her concerns about anti-Semitism, right? And in her apology, she said something like, I realized that this is the impact, not the intention and all that. What did well, you say on it? Yep. Yes. Well, that is, uh, there's a source for that. There is a source for that. And the major source for that is uh, the microaggressions essay that people may or may not know about. But it's called Racial Microaggressions in Everyday Life by Daryl Wing Su, who's a professor of education at Teachers College. And it was co-authored by six other people also connected with Teachers College uh, in New York. I didn't find that essay until around 2015 uh, when an administrator sent it to me or sent it to the faculty, not knowing that none of us had read the essay. And then I realized, oh, my God, that was that's the nest where all this stuff came out. So uh, that phrase was uttered by a uh, administrator. And, and I thought to myself, what in the world are you talking about? Do you know anything about the law? Do you know anything about what uh, hate speech is? Or, or I should say hate crimes. The very idea of a hate crime depends on intention. I couldn't make sense of it. And uh, when I broached the question, there was never any response. That's the other thing. These things seem to be memorized. And if you engage in any kind of intellectual dialogue with these administrators, many of whom, by the way, are nice people, they are well-intentioned, but the idea of engaging in a, in a dialogue uh, that's the least bit contentious about ideas is completely foreign to most of them. So I began hearing that, and before long, it was fairly common to hear it. And um, it's hard exactly to know what the intention by behind that statement is, I'll tell you what the effect is. The effect is to make it possible to suddenly multiply racist incidents by tenfold. Because if it's not the intention, you can say, well, it's the impact. If it's the impact, that impact can be um, sort of amplified by the administrators themselves. They see something and they say, this is racist, this is racist, and everybody gets involved and they say how racist it is. And then they say, look at the impact this has had. <laughs> They, they create it, and then they point to it as if they found it. And the specific example, which I began the Chronicle piece with, was an anti-racist poster put up by, a, by a, what turned out to be a student of color. We didn't know that at the time, but it was passed around as if this were some racist uh, skinhead. Then it turned out it wasn't that at all, and that's when the administrator said, well, intentions don't matter. And that's what I said, what in the world are you talking about? Right. So I was first... shocked when I I was shocked when I heard that from a school principal at my son's school when my son yes. was in trouble for doing something. It was the first time I had heard that. So not surprisingly, it must have started in an education school. Yes. Well, uh, and I didn't realize just how how quickly it had spread because if you talk to any high school student or middle school student and you just ask them that, they'll say, "Yeah." That's as common now as the golden rule used to be. And the golden rule, obviously, is so much superior <laughs> because I, it involves you in the question. It doesn't simply say that, you know, the impact on someone else. Because basically, if, if you translate that phrase, you can see its perniciousness. What it's really saying is it's not the intention, it's the reaction. You see, if you say yes. impact, it makes it sound mechanical and like a law of physics. But it's not. Uh, people are, don't behave like uh, objects uh, unless they're physically struck. Then we can talk about impact. It takes away, and this is, I think, 
whether you say it's intentional is certainly one of the effects. It takes away the will of a human being to react in a particular way. And then you, you say, well, how can you, how can you quarrel with this impact because you've used the word impact and it sounds like you're quarreling with the fact that a baseball has broken out a window. It turns every people into objects and then their responses become mechanical and predetermined in a way. Sure, sure. So I'll turn it over to Jenna after this, but I have, I have one more question. Obviously you're a professor in the system. To what degree have you felt any backlash to your writings on the subject? Um, not much to my writings I have. I mean, you know, um, <laughs> uh, I did have a visit from, you know, a perfectly fine um, person. I think I can't remember what she was, what her position was at the time. It might have been equity and inclusion. She had, she was a professor at the law school. She was brought into this. But I had had conversations with her before. She came to my office after I published the uh, the essay in the Chronicle about uh, higher uh, about ed schools, and um, I didn't quite know what the conversation was about. Uh, and it was perfectly fine. I didn't I didn't mind it, but it was clear that uh, I think she was um, sort of speaking for a number of people on campus, mostly on the administrative side who didn't much uh, appreciate it. And I just said, you know, that's part of life. Uh, I'm sure that when people talk about, uh, you know, pro-choice, there are probably a lot of people who are religious who are unhappy. So this is what a college is. Lots of people being made unhappy by ideas they don't like. But <laughs> if you want to stay in a college and if you're going to have an actual college, obviously that's, that's part, of the, part of the game. You, you don't feel like you were ever in danger, your job was ever in danger. Well, you're, you're a tenured professor, correct me if I'm wrong, so it would be very hard to uh, to fire you, but you didn't feel like you were ever bullied by other faculty members or, or suffered any real consequences for it. No, um, you know, there were, well, um, I had, since I mentioned this in another Quillet article, I, I'm not speaking out of school here, um, there are plenty of indications that, you know, um, my, not only what I wrote, but my questioning particular um, behavior, actions on the part of administrators uh, have, have not done wonders for performance reviews. They've been fairly blatant and obvious, right? <laughs> so much so that, uh, you know, um, student comments were actually fade, uh, fabricated. I don't mean they were somebody filled out the forms, but I had a, a, a dean who's no longer uh, with us, no longer at the school, um, say things about a set of teaching evaluations that no one could find, including uh, my incoming chair and outgoing chair. Uh, and the trouble is when you're in a closed system like this, there's no recourse. You can, you can complain and complain and complain. If I was at a state university, it would probably be different. You could probably get a lawyer and just file some kind of suit, but uh, it's slightly different at a private school. But, you know, it is, the truth is it is, you know, it's always there. Even people can get fired uh, uh, and it's become easier and easier uh, because I think colleges and universities feel emboldened. But, um, you know, uh, I don't intend to stop talking about this. So. I'm glad. You know, so one of these things, Ed, I don't think people fully understand, and I don't know that I do. So I'm going to lay out my understanding of um, of, of your points here. Yeah. I think that, so in, at least in Texas, I know where I am right now. I mean, all high school or all, I'm sorry, K through 12 schools, the teacher must have some sort of a certificate or a degree in education. Yes. And what you're saying is these schools that are, that are giving out these degrees in education yes. are ideologically motivated. Very much so. More so, more so than colleges and universities even. Okay. You know, and that's really interesting. I mean, being in um, academia myself, just recently, there's been a couple of places where I've looked at the applications, both at the university level and the K through 12 level, <laughs> level, excuse me, and you have to sign, and they use the word equity. Yeah. 
It's not equality. And it kind of took me, just the other day, I saw something for a, a K through 12 um, position and it, it, you had to agree to this equity. And so I think what people don't know, or at least what, what I'm just starting to learn myself is that this is baked in. And I think Greg Lukianoff said this as well to us a couple of weeks ago, this is baked into the system. Yes. I mean, are there, are there any, could you get a degree in education to be able to be a teacher anywhere where this is not part of the system that you know of? Well, there are, and maybe for your listeners, this is probably a little helpful. When we talk about ed schools, we're talking about uh, basically three different kinds of institutions. Um, there are undergraduate, there are college and universities that have education as a major, right? Uh, they might also have a graduate department, you know, in the way that a university will have a biology undergraduate program and then a, a place where you can get a PhD, right? So there are some places that just have education as a major and they don't have a graduate school. There are other places, uh, Lewis and Clark, for example, is one where you don't have an education major, but you have a graduate school. So you would major in a in a subject right and um, uh, an academic subject and then you would go to an ed school to get your master's right so there are around 1500 ed schools now there's a third category of freestanding education schools that are really not connected with another uh, university or college and one of them is the most prominent one is teachers college which used to be connected explicitly uh, to Columbia but now it's only kind of in name only um, so that's what we mean by ed schools. There are about 1,500 of them uh, around the nation, which is way, way too many, by the way. Uh, Canada has, um, Canada is obviously smaller than we are, but if we had the same proportion of ed schools that Canada has to its population, we would have 500, not 1,500. So we could lop off two thirds. And the difference that makes, by the way, is that then they become uh, competitive um, and they have to, and you'd also have to control the quality of them. Now we don't have any controls over the quality of education schools. So, but to answer your question, Jennifer, um, uh, it so much depends on the state. Um, there are probably ed schools out there where this isn't uh, um, a, a feature. I'm just not well enough versed on on all of the ed schools around the country to to know you know where one might. Uh, point you. However, one place that's very good to look is a is a, a website in an organization called uh, the National Council on Teacher Quality, run by Kate Walsh. And this is something really a website that every uh, parent and every school board, um, every concerned teacher should know about because they go state by state. They're constantly re, um, releasing reports that. Um, talk about what kind of ed schools are in your state, how they're doing, how they're doing on teaching reading. They have very a clear idea of what counts as scientifically based reading instruction and what doesn't. So that's a great place to go to find out where ed schools are doing their, their jobs. The most prominent ed schools, that's just the ones that have the biggest names like um, Teachers College or Stanford or uh, Michigan. Um, they have what you're, what they call what you refer to um, uh, as they, you know, whatever the commitment is to social justice or, or that. They call them dispositions. Greg Luciano might have talked about this. Dispositions. You have, and really, it's basically a political litmus test with Chase trying to disguise with another word. And of course, the I, well, we can talk about the irony of, uh, of all this uh, in any way. For, I mean, in any case, the, the, the irony of education schools talking about equity or equality is uh, remarkable because they've been a big driver of inequities. In what way? Yeah. Well, um, I take the example of, of reading instruction that I just mentioned. For probably 60 years now, uh, we've known there's a big problem with the way students are taught to read. Actually, we've known this since the 50s. Uh, have you guys heard of the book, uh, Why Johnny Can't Read? Yeah, sure. Published, yeah, published by a guy named Ru Rudolf Fleisch. And, um, and uh, or Flesh, I can't remember. But this was 
he was taking up this question of why our students are so so bad at reading. They shouldn't be, so many of them. And he discovered what most people weren't paying attention to, which, which was that we were teaching reading students to read. And actually, I was sort of taught this way. My teachers did a little bit of both. Did you guys have the Dick and Jane or the Alice and Jerry books? You might be too young mm-hmm. to get those. I had those. Dick and Jane. I absolutely had Dick and Jane, yeah. Yes, I had Alice and Jerry, but it's the same principle. And if you, your teacher might have supplemented those books with, with uh, sort of alphabetic learning. That is, you, I remember having a banner on the, in the front of the classroom with the, you know, the cursive big capital A and the small A and all that. Mm-hmm. Well, you're lucky if you had that because um, a lot of students didn't, and it's pretty rare to find uh, a classroom that has it even today. So um, what he discovered was that uh, elementary schools were teaching reading as if uh, you were learning how learning Chinese characters. That is, you'd learn a word as if you were learning a Chinese character. Uh, now, Chinese characters do actually have parts that are vaguely analogous to alphabets, but it's totally different. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so basically what you had was, you think about this, remember, when you had Alice and Jerry, you'd, you'd learn in an Alice and Jerry book, you'd learn about 17 words and you'd they'd be repeated incessantly. Look, look, you remember that? <laughs> and the dog was spot. <laughs> and, yeah, and it was just repeated. And so you learned what the words looked like just in the way you would learn what a Chinese character looked like. Now, if you're fortunate enough, and maybe Jennifer and David, both of you were maybe, to have parents who had already taught you the alphabet, right? Then this wasn't a problem for you because you could actually make head make sense of the of the words alphabetically. But there's a whole class of children who don't have parents like that, who didn't have time to right. teach them their ABCs or teach them that sometimes a C sounds like an S, right? Uh, or what happens when you have an S and an H? It's a sh sound. So if you don't have parents like that, you are up a creek. And that's what happens and it's still happening uh, in many schools, most schools across the nation, unfortunately. So the people that are left behind in this are the disadvantaged students and the minority students, especially. That's why we have in some districts, one of the reasons why we have in some school districts, 80 percent of the fourth graders not reading at grade level. Um, And there's a socioeconomic uh, uh, component in all this, but it has primarily to do with how much you you get at home. And if you don't get it at home, uh, that's going to show up in your in your fourth grade uh, reading capacity because the schools aren't teaching reading the way they should. You know, you just said something. You 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 touched on a sweet spot for me because I I speak Chinese. I learn Chinese, mm. and here's something I, I I I've had this kind of theory. It's my own, you know, Jennifer's hypothesis. Uh, and I love Chinese. And there's there is a little bit of the phonetic, but not really, you know. Yes. Yeah. So here's something though that I think I, I think that where you do see some cultural differences in China, and uh, you know, I have a huge group of friends who are are Chinese, lived in China for a while, is that you have to memorize, right? Yeah. So there's not a it's right. not it's not like a learning process. It well, I mean, there's course there's learning in memorization but it's not something organic is you have to memorize so it's very rote you know and it's and rote memory and I think for that reason again this is Jennifer's hypothesis I think for that reason you know a lot of my friends who are native Chinese might not even speak English all that well but they will score amazingly you know I mean they're off the Mm -hmm. charts on on English tests and whatnot and a lot of yeah. that is because of that ability to memorize. And so it's a different skill set. But at the yes. same time, I feel like one of the big differences that I've seen is, that, you know, that's a skill set of an, in and of itself, which is an amazing skill set. But where it's lacking is in creativity, because I feel like in mm-hmm. the phonetic way of learning a language where you have to kind of piece things together and put in your mind and play around with it offers yes. more of a fluid kind of creative environment to learning than the rote memory. And so that's my Jennifer's hypothesis to yes. language learning and language acquisition between a phonetic language and a language like Chinese. Yes. 
Well, one of the problems, I mean, one of the, you know, people might ask, well, how in the world did, did we get to that? Did we stop teaching the, people sometimes talk about phonics. I think it makes more sense to talk about the alphabetic way of teaching reading. That is starting with memorizing the letters of the alphabet. You know, and their names, not their sounds right off, but their names, right? So we know what we're talking about. Kids love to do this, by the way. You know, you can make this very fun. So the idea that, oh, the students hate this because it's rote is nonsense. If you have a dull teacher, you can make anything dull. But so this is not really a problem with children. So, um, and there's something wonderfully creative, you know, about um, about um, the alphabet. I mean, it's such a miraculous invention. You don't even think about it. Um, but, you know, in contrast to, for example, the Dick and Jane series, you know, if you're teaching the alphabet first, just think how many words, once you learn this short A and the short T, and then you know your alphabet, pat, mat, fat, you've got words, you know, you've got 50 words in the time it takes to memorize seven in the Dick and Jane series. It's crazy that anybody thought there was another way of doing this, but this was the product really of an ideology that really takes place in the, that grows up in the thirties and forties. There was a economic motive too, because one of the things the Dick and Jane series required was you had to keep getting that series of books because each book built on the previously memorized set of words, you see what I mean? So there's an economic motive to keep this going. Now the, there's a great resource I just found on this whole subject. I've been looking, trying, trying to find the best books on this. And the best book I've found, and it was recommended to me by another book, maybe you guys know John uh, Gatto, G-A-T-T-O. He's kind of a wild man of... Uh, of <laughs> education, education Renegade. I think it was the Teacher of the Year. It became a That's Education right. Renegade. Yeah, I, yes, I, I yes. follow him. Yeah. So he's got this big book called The Underground History of American Education. It's fantastic. Really good. He's, he's just such he's a great renegade. Writer. Oh, he really yeah. is. Well, the book he recommended in that book about reading uh, was a book called The New Illiterates by Samuel uh, Blumenfeld. Yeah, Samuel Blumenfeld. This came out in the 70s. A mind-blowing book. Because mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out what the whole, where the whole word business came from. You know, the whole word, the whole language. There's several varieties of this thing where you put alphabetic learning last in the series of things you do when you teach children to read. This comes actually, and this is crazy, it comes from the 1830s when a guy named Gallaudet, you may never recognize that name, mm -hmm. was trying to figure out how you taught uh, deaf children to read. And he realized that they don't have any way of making sense of a phoneme because the phoneme is based on sound, but they're going to need to be able to read letters. How do you do it? And he realized you had to teach them as if you were teaching Chinese characters. That turns out to be a bad way of teaching even deaf children. <laughs> but but uh, it was that primer that Gallaudet produced, and I think it was 1835 or 1840. That thing got taken back up in the 1880s, and it circulated around. And believe it or not, it made its way into the whole word or whole language movement as a way of teaching children to read. The second stage of this, by the way, is 1967 with a guy named Ken Goodman. You ever heard of Kenneth Goodman? Ken Goodman, he just died and his, he started what was called the three cueing um, method of teaching reading, mm -hmm. MSV, MSV for short. And the three cueing was you taught children to Again, this you didn't talk about the alphabet. You just uh, M MSV. M stands for meaning. S stands for structure, and V stands for visual. Mm -hmm. So you teach kids sort of to read by just reading a lot aloud to them and hoping they pick it up. And then you would say you come across a new word, and you say, "Well, what what kind of word would you, would you expect to be here?" So if you're talking about a boat, you might expect a sail to be there. Of course, that's only if you know about boats and sails, all right? So let's just leave that aside for a moment. And then the S comes, the syntax. What kind of word would you expect to be here, you know? And then the third one was the visual clue, that is, the letter. Now, if this sounds insane uh, to you, it is. And this has been going on 
there's a version of this been going that's been going on for 30 or 40 years in teacher education programs. Right. And it's gained a sort of ideological fervor, right? It's become almost like a, a left-right issue. Well, that's sort of the phonics people and the yeah. whole language people. Am I, yes. am I defining it correctly? And, and, you know, just to jump in, that's exactly, because they were going to the exact same place. Like, I, my question is just like, why? Like, was there something broken? And what were they fixing? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's okay. I just found an essay today that I've, you know, again, I'm constantly on the search for somebody who's helping me fill in this uh, uh, crazy story. And it's a, an essay I found somewhere. It's called The Leftist Invasion of Reading Instruction. And the guy's name is Patrick Goff, and he's a professor emeritus at San Diego University. And he fills in the story about how this got connected with left right politics. And uh, I mean, I knew a little bit about it, but he's, he really sums it up very uh, nicely. Um, part of it goes back to something you said, Jennifer, about, I mean, this is kind of strange. Uh, they worried the sort of people, I, I don't know, you can't call them progressives, it doesn't make sense. And I suppose you could call them leftists. They worried that when you transmitted knowledge, you were transmitting power structure, right? Mm -hmm. That was the idea. So traditional knowledge, and you can people you can hear people say this and quote this: traditional knowledge is repressive by its very nature. This is kind of a standard routine among sort of less leftist ed school people, and of course also about uh, people in sociology and, and some parts of uh, philosophy too. So their solution was to first of all get rid of as much traditional knowledge as you possibly could. Uh, it's why one of the examples or one of the reasons why ed schools have, have been so opposed to curriculum uh, and a content oriented curriculum is precisely because they imagine that if you teach content, the content will bring along with it repression. Well, tell that to Karl Marx, who spent you know, years, day after day after day in the British Library. Tell that to Foucault. And again, I'm just talking about people on the left here. Tell that to Derrida, who taught, you know, uh, uh, history of philosophy course in uh, in the Sorbonne for 25 years. None of these things is is actually true. The way you liberate people, as we all know, is make sure that they have the tools necessary uh, to think on their own, to think properly and carefully, mm -hmm. and. Uh, can I, can I, uh, it, it seems to me that there, and I've seen this in some, I, I was very interested in, I've written a series of articles on education and I sort of, um, I sort of resonate with John Gatto's school. I, I think that the educational model is, is broken and, and we need, um, we need to do more to sort of customize the educational experience to kids. But it, it seemed to me that one of the issues, the ideological issues that was getting in the way was this idea that somehow any, any kind of educational approach that worked for, um, let's say, middle class, upper middle class kids should also be applied to kids from more disadvantaged backgrounds. And that that yes. was a mistake. That yes. was, that's the fallacy um, there. You know, for example, I'm not a big fan of educational testing, right? Uh, because I, yeah. I worry that you end up teaching kids to the test. So I don't want my kids in a school that puts a premium on testing. However, if I was in a, if I was living in an area with a really dysfunctional school system where I didn't think anything was being done right, maybe testing is the way that you make sure that there's sort of a minimal level of competency in that school system. So I'm trying to fix a different problem. I'm trying to make sure that first there's competence. And, um, and in my own school system, I'm not worried so much about competence. I'm worried about, I'm worried about excellence and I'm worried about customization. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I think that, there, that, that there's a danger in trying to apply a one size fits all approach to fixing systems and that we're making matters worse for kids in disadvantaged environments by bringing that fallacy to the table. That's sort that's, of a digression of it. No, that's a, actually, David, that is that is a key to everything. I mean, that that takes us back to John Dewey uh, at the, the, the lab school, yeah. the University of Chicago, 
Absolutely. But Dewey had enough sense to know that the lab school would only work because, you know, they got those kids from mostly from Chicago professors kids. Right? right. So they had they had a <laughs> they had training <laughs> without even knowing it just by sitting around the dinner table, the libraries in their homes. So uh, John Dewey, you know, takes the lab school and it's worked very well for kids, uh, not only in that socioeconomic level, but who have this basically, you know, 24 hour day classes from the time they're you know, two years old to the time they're seven. Well, what do you do about a kid on the south side of Chicago who doesn't have that environment? Well, then you bring him that into that world and you say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, you know, they're so far behind because they haven't had the training, but that's the problem too with Ken Goodman. Ken Goodman said, look, I know this three queuing works because I've seen it work with kids, my friends and family. Yeah, right, right sure. Ken. Uh, have you tried it on uh, inner city kids or kids in Appalachia? No. <laughs> and uh, the, the blindness on that on that issue is just uh, almost hard to believe. Uh, and this is why I said it early on, the irony of the, the equity coming from ed schools in particular. They have been the primary drivers of inequities in the American education system for 70 years. That's incredible. Yeah, it's, 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 it's another example and a, perhaps a very poignant one on how ideology corrupts sort of clear thinking and solving problems. And I think to me, by the way, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm so concerned that these ideologies that are supposedly done to benefit marginalized people are actually making, hurting them. And, um, and that supposedly well-meaning people and some of them are genuinely well-meaning people are doing things that are that are that because they have bought into this ideology that's actually making things worse um and um and that's and and that's why i, I mean i think that we were talking before we started on the actual podcast about policing that's an example of making things worse when you diagnose a problem wrong because you say it's the result of systemic racism, when it may be a result of some other kind of factor in, in society, um, you're making things worse because you're not focused on the, the root cause of it. And, yes. and this is an, an, an education systems are making things worse when they're applying a one size fits all approach that might help kids um, in, in a certain economic bracket and harm kids in another economic bracket. So we're, yeah. we, we make things, we make it harder for us to solve problems. Uh, sorry about my little rant there. but I <laughs> No, you're, you're exactly but, right. Uh, well, and, I, um, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, I, I, I want to weigh on for both sides. So I, you know, I've seen, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Catherine um, Burblesing. I believe that's her name. She started a school in the UK. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, tiger, she... tiger parents or something like that. <laughs> well, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's what she she would call it herself. But she, you know, she's a, in a low income area in you yes. know, downtown London. Um, and her big thing is, you know, you've got to do the basics. You've got to yes. teach the basics. There's got to be structure. Yeah. Then I've got a friend of mine who is a fabulous educator, and he's teaching at a school that. He, um, it, you know, it's a private school. He's trying to bring this to everyone, but it's a private school where it, it's really like without the structure, right? It's more of a, um, uh, what's the name of the school? Well, anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, it's Waldorf was what I was, was going to say. Oh, yeah. Yes. More of like, you know, the child, like let the child's curiosity reign, right. let the mm -hmm. child kind of free play, that kind of stuff. And so I'm kind of in between because, you know, the free play is something that's, that, that is good, of course. And like you learn through, making mistakes but at the same time if that that it's funny because that worked really well my friend who, who teaches in this school but it's a private school for all you know very wealthy yeah. kids who get you know parents are talking to them more and more they're giving them more and more resources you look at Catherine Burblesing's school and I hope I'm saying her name right um yeah. and she's like no and, and it's more lit, low income school where maybe they yes. just don't have the same resources she's like you have got to teach the basics and so there's yeah. these exactly different the point ways. Right. Well, there's right. different mindsets around education. I'm hearing what you guys were saying, David. I thought your point was really interesting that you can't have a one size fits all. Um, but I mean, I would you say, though, in that that, OK, I mean, in some way, this is a disparity in and of itself. If you are upper, you know, middle class, upper class, you know, uh, they say 
more people, two parents in the household, whatever, where you're hearing more words. Okay, you get to do the free play. You know, you get to do the creative stuff. Mm -hmm. If you are lower income, you don't have that those same resources, you've got to hit the books this way. I mean, is would, what do you think about that? Um, well, my daughter went to a Waldorf school starting in the second grade. And she went up <laughs> through the seventh grade, largely because, I mean, there were lots of things wrong with it. Uh, their language instruction was, you know, non-existent, even though they were supposed to be learning Spanish. Um, but there were lots of enough good things about the school uh, that made it very worthwhile. And what's interesting is there was a lot of content. It wasn't just sort of free play. There was a lot of content. They learned about Greek myths. They learned about the Bible. They learned lots of stuff. So that's on that subject or on that score, they're very similar. Um, if you look at schools and and the the school you were talking about it was Kathleen Burbles. I can't remember her name. It's a it's a it's a difficult name <laughs> to remember. Burbles thing, I think. <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I got her book and I, I like it very much. But the American analogy, you know, there are two of them. One is obviously Success Academy with Eva Moskowitz up in New York. But there's another one up there that I mentioned in one of my Colette essays by Jeffrey uh, School that's superintended by Jeffrey Litt. It's the icon mm -hmm. schools, the charter schools. OK, so one of those things, one of the things that both those schools have in common, they're they're both dealing with low income students. And I think the the uh, icon schools are all in the South Bronx and they're very strict about a lot of things. You know, you and uh, you have to come to school wearing particular kinds of clothing. You can't come to school, you know, with socks missing and all that kind of stuff. Um, the two schools treat disciplinary issues very differently, however, as, as, as similar as they are. If you want just sheer success in terms of scores, uh, success Academy is probably the place to go. But if you want success and a, and a far more kind of, I would say, humane uh, treatment of children, then look at the ICOM schools. Uh, they don't, they rarely kick anybody out. There are very few suspensions. And Jeffrey Litt, who's, you know, really American hero, he should be, if people need more about it. You know, he said, unconditional love. That's the secret. Mm -hmm. So what, I think what those, to go back to your, your question, I don't see these two as a, as a sort of, uh, as, as being opposed. The truth is those wealthy kids could do, would do very well at, at either Success Academy or, or the Icon schools. They would do very well. And they would do very well at the Waldorf school. My sense is they'd probably do very well, even better at the Icon schools, uh, truth be told. Because those schools don't, it's, it's not just sort of ramrod uh, content memorization. It's, it's the opposite of that in a way. They emphasize content. But with content comes freedom. You know, you're not going to be a jazz improviser unless you know a hell of a lot about <laughs> music. Um, so likewise, there's freedom in this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, constraint. The difference is, though, that while those, those uh, wealthy kids will do well, in either school, I think even better in the more more rigid charter schools, the low income kids will not. Uh, they won't because the kind of structure and discipline that most of those wealthy kids will have just as a matter of course, right? Uh, sort of resisting impulse. I mean, not that all wealthy kids are like that. On the contrary, many of them are just the opposite. But, but that kind of thing is just comes with the territory of successful two-parent families, right? But if you've got a family, and this can this cuts across racial lines, where the mom is is a, say a single mom, she's working hard to put food on the table. She's not home. Uh, that's a chaotic environment already. Those kids don't have the kind of self-discipline very often. Again, these are huge generalizations that those wealthier kids have already. So the freedom for them in the school is, is, is possible in a way that uh, I think for the children who are living in chaotic environments who come to school hungry, uh, it doesn't work for them as well. Mm -hmm. you know. That makes a lot of sense. And I've got one question before, before we let you go though. You were talking about, I'm going back a little bit. 
but getting yeah. rid of traditional knowledge and that content is oppression. And that's one of the reasons that we've seen this, these differences in reading and, and moving from, um, I use the word phonetics, but le- moving from learning like your alphabet to words having, you know, le- memorizing words. Yes. But you said you wrote something and I'm really interested in this. Do you think that that's why, I mean, you wrote something that I'd never heard before. I didn't know. I mean, we hear defund the police. We hear defund this, defund that. Now, what I learned from you is we're talking about defund STEM. Yes, that was a... Is that like really happening? And well, is that because of that, you know, oh, well, it's traditional knowledge, so do away yeah. with it? Yeah. There is a ridiculous suggestion that keeps coming back, which is that um, <clears throat> what they call traditional knowledge, but that they just mean traditional subject matter. So it can go from the history, the humanities, biology, all of these things, uh, that there's some, something fundamentally uh, racist about these um, subject matters. And they, for evidence of it, they say, well, look at the disparities uh, in performances when we, when we you know, look at, say, math scores among eighth graders or 12th graders. And indeed, if you look at the nation's report card, which you guys may be familiar with, it comes out every two years and it basically tells you where we are. You do see uh, racial differences, but the racial differences are very often just income differences uh, as much as anything else. But it looks like a racial difference. And to some degree, it is because more more kids uh, from uh, minority families you know, grow up in in um, in dysfunctional schools. So instead of saying, why is this happening? They say, oh, there must be something wrong with this, with this subject matter itself. The subject matter must be white supremacist. Well, uh, Success Academy just um, graduated a class of seniors, uh, all black and Hispanic, who uh, beat the average of uh, white students from sort of more heavily funded schools by, you know, uh, scores of points. <laughs> and this doesn't, you don't have to have a charter school to do this. There are public schools that do this. Um, so the danger of this is that you will mask the problem. David was talking about this earlier. The problem is not that there is something racist about STEM. The problem is we have incompetent uh, teachers and education schools. And when you start doing away with these things, when you start doing away, for example, with grading, you are basically uh, hiding the source of the problem. It's like uh, the way we fix, you know, a fever is by breaking the thermometer. That's what they're that's what they're trying to do. So the funny thing is, I wouldn't mind it if my kids were not graded. But I think that uh, if you apply that same standard to inner city schools, you're going to exactly as you said, mask the incompetence of those schools. We're just not going to be able to measure them. Whereas if if a teacher allows my kids to go out and, you know, and study whatever they want, I'm I'm okay with it because I yeah. know that they have the basics. And at that point, it's all gravy. They're learning how to think. They're learning how to debate. I if they learn more of one subject than the other, that's fine as long as they're as long as if they're learning. Yet I yes. think that would not work at all for um for these schools that don't have that minimal level of competence. Um, well, there's a great book on the subject, David, called um, uh, Other People's Children by Lisa Delpit, written and published in 1994. And it's so, it's so smart and funny and wise about this very issue. I'll just give you one little anecdote really quickly. She talks about, so she's, she's herself as African-American and a teacher and a really wonderful writer too, by the way. And she said, you know, it's funny because um, when oftentimes when white teachers deal with black children, they will often say, do you feel like starting your math now? Would you? And they ask these sort of questions, right? <laughs> well, this is an example of sort of cultural difference. Uh, uh, and of course, it depends on the kind of home the black kid was raised, the kind of home the white kid was raised in. Not all white parents say, would you like to, <laughs> you know, this now. But uh, she said, a lot of white parents, uh, white teachers don't understand what a black kid hears that, at least inner city black kids, the kind of kids she teaches, that doesn't make any sense to them. They don't know what no, that I means. Right. So yeah, so when they don't do it and then the teacher gets mad at them, they're totally baffled. Whereas if you have a teacher saying, you need to do your math right now, they've got that. 
So this is just one example, and I recommend this book uh, highly. It's, it's very, uh, 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 such a wonderfully interesting and humane book about cultural differences without being uh, sort of uh, judgmental, which most of those books uh, are, and hers right. is not. So, well, you know, so I, I know one, more, one thing about that particular issue. I, I feel like we need to develop a compassionate discourse on cultural differences so we can start talking about culture and why it matters. And yes. I feel like we've, we, you know, culture, when some of the people who critique culture do it in, in, such, a, in such a demeaning way that um, I understand why people are going to try to protect themselves against racism, but yes. it's still highly explanatory. And yeah. if we don't learn how to talk about it in a thoughtful way, then we're not going to actually get at the root of some of the problems that need to be solved. Yes, that's right. Well, that and I, that kind of touches what I was thinking is we talk so much about equality of opportunity and you know everyone having the same resources, but the same resources doesn't mean that you teach the same is what I'm hearing from you mm -hmm. guys. That's kind of what I'm taking away from this. In order to get equality of opportunity, we have to tr treat each situation different mm -hmm. based on the... Yeah. Yeah, and that's and then but but see when we hear equality we think equal so it's like if the you know wealthier kids are getting this then the you know the lower income kids need to be getting this too but it's not where that doesn't lead to equality that leads to yeah. more disparity yes so this is a this is a way in which you know the equity argument you know all these things say there's some grain of truth in them in other words if you just say we're going to treat everybody equal we're going to treat the same class you know first graders regardless of income. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I get them on this, but this the the, the problem is the <laughs> to, to repeat myself. Uh, the public schools are doing the opposite of that. In other words, you better make sure that those kids who are from disadvantaged homes are getting what David's kids. I mean, just like look at the books behind David. You know uh, that means something. Uh, so the kids that don't have access to those books and don't have access to a father like David who can talk and who's, who's you know talks about ideas at the dinner table and his friends over and Jennifer same thing, uh, you know you could look at that and say we have to make sure that the kids who don't have that get it in the first three or four or five years of their education so that they are so that they have basically gotten an equitable treatment because we have a lot of ground to make up. And if the schools aren't making up that ground, guess who gets left behind? We know that the, that the uh, performance gap between those uh, two groups will get wider and wider and wider. And very often those uh, young children who start out with a gap will lose even more, will lose the ground every year to the kids who come from homes like, you know, Davidson and, and, and your Jennifer. It's fascinating because I'm a big proponent of, you know, kids getting again i think i conflated equality with equal resources because i'm like all kids yeah. need the same resources and listening to you guys well maybe not um maybe they need different resources in order to create the equality yeah they here here's the thing i i think i would put it um see if this makes sense Jennifer. um i do think that every kid can you can have let's let's imagine just a typical public school class and let's say that public school room has kids whose parents are both professionals they're both at home on the one hand and then on the other hand you have a child who's from a, a broken home with maybe just one parent and they're you know have they're coming to school hungry so that's you know let's just imagine that that situation exists so i don't think it's so much that you have to say well we got to teach these two children uh, necessarily differently it does mean you have to i mean at some point that's going to have to be the case because what are you going to do are you going to you know you, you've got such wide disparities already by the time first grade starts that even though they're in the same classroom the subject matter is just going to be so familiar to one kid and not familiar to the other so you just have to make absolutely sure and this is really doesn't have to do with resources it doesn't necessarily have to do with money you can have as much money as you want. And if you're not teaching those children, for example, to go back to the subject we were talking about, if you're not teaching those kids phonics and you're not teaching them their ABCs, uh, it won't matter. No amount of money is going to fix that. And we know this to be true just on a practical level because, uh, sorry, I keep throwing out books, but 
the the series has been very helpful to me to see this too is uh, um, a book called um, um, "It's Being Done." Uh, it's a uh, uh, Karen Chenoweth is her name. Karen K A R I N I think is how you know, spell her name. And the first book came out in 2007. These are schools. She she profiles 12 schools that are from that are teaching in you know low income areas. Uh, and and yet are succeeding. The test scores show that these kids are doing really well. And so she takes 12 of these schools and they're all across the country in very different circumstances. Most of them, one of the requirements is that they need to be mostly disadvantaged kids and preferably uh, high minority populations. And she says, but how do they work? So what do they all have in common? Um, so in other words, it doesn't, it, and they don't have to be funded at this huge level. Many of them are struggling with funding. Mm -hmm. Um, not having money doesn't help, <laughs> but having money doesn't solve the problem necessarily. Right. And her point is that if you look at what they're doing, and she has a list of things that all these schools have in common, and one of the things is, of course, a laser-like focus, I can almost quote her directly, on curriculum, on what students are taught. And the second thing is how, these, how each grade level content builds on the previous one. Now, this seems so obvious. I think most parents have it in the back of their minds that, of course, well, sure, that's what they're doing, right? They're not. The typical state requirements as far as grade levels are so abstract in general, they're kind of meaningless. So as a result, most teachers, when they get into a classroom, go online to find curriculum. Ninety-nine, Over 90%, this is where, uh, sorry, another book, uh, Robert Pondicio's book, I think that's how you pronounce his name, uh, on Success Academy. It's called How Other People Learn. I think that's the book title. Uh, and, and anyway, he's, he's talking about this remarkable fact. I think it was a study, uh, a RAND study that came out. They said, where's teachers getting their curricular ideas from? They go on the web. Mm. Uh, there's typically no sort of stack progression of, of content. So it's really not surprising, you know, again, that, that our that American students are not doing as well as they should. But you would say um, in the way that they learn before this idea of curriculum and this stack progression, I mean, I feel like that's how I learned. When, when did that turn off? When did we, when did we, uh, you said about two decades ago is when you started noticing it. Was there something about two well, that decades was <clears throat> now, that was when, when the ed school people started moving into colleges and universities. They had previously been confined to, to giving degrees to teachers and K-12 through administrators, you see. So, mm -hmm. so we kept ed schools kind of under wraps <laughs> and, and, and contained their damage to the K-12 through system, which was bad enough, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But around the 90s is when they began making inroads into colleges and universities and uh which is just uh, would have been unimaginable in the 80s even the 90s people didn't realize what was happening but in the 2000s all that took off so and uh, a, a really great book on on all of this is someone i haven't mentioned yet uh today edie hirsch who whose book cultural literacy back in 1987 sort of made was a big time bestseller but his follow-up book, I think, is even more remarkable. It's called The Schools We Need and Why We Don't Have Them. If you want a history of the, the failed schooling in the United States and why, that's the book to go to. Okay. And he talks about the anti-curriculum movement in uh, American education schools. Now, if you did get a sort of stacked uh, curriculum in which, you know, say this eighth grade teachers knew what the seventh grade teachers were teaching, or if you went in to school in a state where, where did you, where'd you grow up, Jennifer? By the way? Well, all over with my dad in air force, but my, you know, I'd say K, uh, K through third grade was in Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about Ohio, but in, um, in Massachusetts, for example, there are some very fine public schools. Uh, and 10 years ago, there were even more fine ones because they were following basically E.D. Hirsch's idea of a carefully set curriculum that was that was a graded curriculum, not in the sense of marks on a paper, but you know, um, building on the previous one. Um, and you know, 
it's the way you teach anything else. Uh, so it's very, it's strange to most people that uh, there's no set curriculum and curricular progression in most public schools, but there, there really isn't. So uh, would you say then, does this go back to what you were saying earlier, that once we, well, first of all, once the ed schools really became, you know, more ubiquitous, but that it plays on this idea of traditional knowledge and to kind of traditional knowledge is, is power. And so therefore we're going to break down the power system and therefore we're doing away with curriculum. Is that all related? It's all, yes, it's all of a piece. Now there's a, there's a second component in this too, which goes back to what was called progressive education in the uh, 19, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And people like uh, John Dewey, I mentioned him earlier. And the so-called uh, progressive education movement uh, focused primarily on the creativity of the child, you know, which is again, something very valuable. I think we all understand the difference, the way we feel differently when we're pursuing something because we're interested. And when we're just told stuff, we're supposed to regurgitate on a test. So as with many things, there's a grain of truth to this, but the progressive education movement brought along with it an idea that the child, the individual child knows, has already basically its, its essence and its motor. It has its own curiosity, its own almost natural destiny. So the idea that then you would just, you know, put this one curriculum across a classroom and not try to respond to each individual child was uh, anathema to the progressive educationists. Uh, so you see what I mean? That's another stream in this. They said one of the other reasons the curriculum is bad is not just because traditional knowledge is bad, but because the idea that we would be uh, giving all these very different individual students the same kind of knowledge, that's a terrible thing. So it was kind of a double whammy that produced the situation that we're in now where uh, most public schools really don't have any kind of when I say step curriculum, I mean in terms of content mm -hmm. uh, so that students learn early on, you know, about Egypt, for example, or, or Africa, know where the mm -hmm. continents are. So that the next year you can talk about uh, 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 history, you can talk about colonialism in the sixth, in the sixth grade or the eighth grade, because now when people, you refer to Africa, uh, people know what you're talking about, right? Right, right. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. I feel... Yeah, reading your stuff and like I, when we Greg Lukianoff just touched on it, but it really yeah. and when I read your stuff, I was like, yeah, so it spark, sparked the interest. But then I did, but I didn't know much about it. And then reading your stuff about um, how we're educating in, in the K through twelve, I mean, it all kind of makes sense, and it feels like the root of the issue is is going and 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 um, uh, what's the word reforming? I guess. The, yeah. The way we're educating educators absolutely that's that's where it has to start and then the teachers unions too but mm -hmm. uh because you know there are a lot of great teachers out there but mm -hmm. they're not given they're not given i mean i had a had a student of mine very very fine student who graduated 12 12 years ago and she went into teaching she went to an ed school and she said i couldn't believe it i have all this money that i've spent on tuition i'm up to my years in student loans and i learned nothing Mm -hmm. And so I was going to be thrown out into a, a school system and I had no idea about uh, the curriculum that I was to teach because I didn't know what the students came to my class knowing and nobody else knew either. You see, this is people just don't, you know, that's one of the problems with American society. If you have two parents working, everybody's busy as hell. They say, okay, well, I'm going to let you take care of the, my, my kids. And they don't know what's happening in schools. They know now a little bit better because of COVID and they get yeah. to see some of the yeah. nonsense that's happening. So, so yeah. COVID in that sense may, be, may have been at least uh, a blessing uh, in mm -hmm. terms of education, but uh, we'll, we'll have to see. We might look back at this and think that was one of the best things, you know, devastating although, but one yes. of the best things to happen because it is, that's mm -hmm. all the stories that I hear of parents, they're like, I would never have known if I didn't yes, listen right. in. Um, and as you said, they're trying to keep it from being known by saying, no, 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 you know, it doesn't leave the room and all this nonsense. Well, they're doing this to kids. 
yeah. as well. He's saying, you know, what what the phrase they use is another ed school uh, colloquialism. They say, you know, what what's what's is said here stays here. Yeah, it's nonsense. You know? That's not knowledge. No, and you ask them why? Why do you want it yeah. to get out? Yeah. I mean, knowledge like is something that stands up to truth, and 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 if That's it's right. truthful, then you shouldn't be afraid, right? You're you've just admitted to me that you are <laughs> you are propagandizing when you tell me that it has to stay here. <laughs> uh, frightening. Yeah. All right, lad. Thank you so much. Okay, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Let's right. we'll talk again soon. I hope. I look forward to it. Okay. Right. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hold My Drink. Like or subscribe to the show and check out the show notes for links to source material and to our website where you can find what each of us is reading every week. Different news with different views. If you have a topic that you would like us to explore, drop us a line. And join us next week as we say Hold My Drink and the conversation gets real.